I'm preaching from Mark 12 today. As we continue our, our sermon series in Mark, as you recall, with chapter 11, Jesus had arrived at Jerusalem, and it was the last time that he was going to come to Jerusalem. He's made it clear to his disciples that on this visit to that city that he will be betrayed, arrested, and crucified, and that he will rise again. We have seen a change in the way that he is conducting himself and that he has become much more direct about presenting himself now as Messiah, as the son of David. Just before entering Jerusalem, he allowed blind Bartimaeus to call him the son of David, and he did not tell him to keep quiet about that as he so often did prior to that. And in entering Jerusalem, we saw that at his initiative, he obtained a donkey that he might ride in as Israel's king. And we saw how he did not stop those who were honoring him as king and who praised him as the one who came in the name of the Lord to save and also to establish the kingdom of his father David. And then we saw how on the very next day, he went into the temple and drove out the money changers. These things spoke very loudly to the people that saw these things. Those money changers and those that were selling animals for sacrifice, declaring that his father's house was to be a house of prayer. And when challenged about the source of his authority for doing these things, where do you have your authority? Where does it come from? He exposed the hypocrisy of those who led that inquisition, asking them about the authority of John the baptizer, and what, where his herald, what his authority was. They professed ignorance, and he told them that he would therefore not tell them about where the source of his authority. By not acknowledging the authority of God's prophet John, these leaders rejected God's authority. Because, of course, the prophets were sent in God's name. And when they did not affirm a prophet, then they showed themselves to be in rebellion against God. Until they were willing to admit what they thought of John's authority, there was no purpose for Jesus to assert his authority as being from God. We have, uh, what we have then in chapter 12, as we come into that, it's right after that um, inquisition when Jesus uh, basically exposed their hypocrisy, is that Jesus follows that up with a parable. In this parable, he compares the church's wicked, hypocritical leaders who are rejecting him with wicked vine dressers who acted as if they owned the vineyard that they were given a, a, as, te to, as tenants to look after. And uh, we see how that um, they would not give fruit to the owner, the fruit that belonged to him. They were to keep a portion and give him a f the, the fruit of the vineyard, and they refused to do that, claiming that it was theirs. The leaders who were opposing Jesus understood that this parable was about them, but instead of repenting as they might have done, they saw all the more to destroy him. So listen carefully as I read this passage to you. This is God's word. Mark 12, beginning in verse 1. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent them another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, sent him away shamefully treated. And again, he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. 
Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy and infallible word. So the delegation from the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes had come to question Jesus' authority. And uh, they, they saw... Uh, to, to, Jesus, Jesus knew that just as their forefathers had killed the prophets that God had sent them. Now, <laughs> my, my words are all jumbled up. I'm just going to start over. <laughs> the delegation from the Sanhedrin who had come to question Jesus' authority saw clearly that Jesus was on to them, that he understood that they were ready to kill him. He knew that they were behaving just as their forefathers had behaved when they killed the prophets that God had sent to them. Now, in the same manner, they were seeking to kill Jesus, God's only son, whom he had sent. God had made these priests and elders overseers of his people. But instead of leading them for God, they had acted as if they owned the church. This continues to be a huge problem in the church to this day that her leaders act as if they own the church and as if, as if the fruits of the church are theirs. And looking at this passage, we will consider especially how it teaches us and reminds us that God is the owner of the church. My prayer is that all who hear this sermon will come to more fully recognize that and more fully live in the light of that truth that God owns the church. It seems so simple, but it's so difficult for us to accept. Let's begin with the very simple fact itself. God is the owner of the church. Just as in the parable of the vineyard, there is an owner. So the church has an owner. You can see how the parable begins by referring to the owner as a man. A man planted a vineyard, and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower. This man is the rightful owner because he is the one who, who owned the land, and he's the one who did all the work to make this vineyard, to establish it. He obtained the land, He planted the vineyard. He put a hedge around it, some kind of a protection. It could be the word that's used there. could refer to a stone wall or a a, a hedge of thorns or any number of things that they would use to protect it. And uh, he also um, built the the wine press where they could uh, get the wine out from the grapes. And uh, he also built a watchtower that would be used for storage. Sometimes these things were 15 or 20 feet tall, and they would also use it as a lookout to see if there were any, you know, animals coming or or thieves or anything like that toward the vineyard. It took about five years before a vineyard would be productive. So there was a significant investment involved whenever you had a vineyard. God, of course like that man was the owner of the vineyard in the parable, God, of course, is the rightful owner of all things. As it says in Psalm 24, 1 and 2, the earth is the Lord's 
in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Why? For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the world, the, the waters. The world belongs to him because he's the one that made the world. It is here for his purposes, ultimately. Not for anyone else's purposes, not for Satan's purposes, not for our purpose. It's for his purpose. The Bible teaches us, of course, that the whole human race fell in Adam. And in our rebellion, we acted as if the world belongs to us instead of to God. Now, there's a sense in which he made the world for us and gave it to us. But in doing that, he did it as we are those who belong to him and are to use it for him and his glory, not in our own way. So ultimately, it belongs to him, and yet in a secondary way, it's belong to us, it belongs to us and we're to manage it and use it for God's glory. We took it to use it for our own selfish purposes and not for the glory of God in our own lives, not for the glory of God, but for our own purposes. So God owns everything. We need to see even further to that, that he especially owns the church. And that's what the vineyard represents here. In our parable, the vineyard represents not the whole world, but the church that God owns. Now this imagery of using a vineyard to represent the people of God, the church, the assembly, the great assembly, uh, was imagery that was familiar to the Jews from the Old Testament. Isaiah speaks in Isaiah chapter 5 of Israel as God's vineyard, and he accuses them, actually the Lord is speaking through Isaiah, of not bringing forth the fruit that he was looking for, a vineyard that uh, was going to be nearly destroyed, Isaiah says, by God's judgment because it was not bringing forth the fruit that was sought there. That fruit, of course, is God's people living for him as his image bearers, living for his glory in the world. The people of God are to be distinguished from everyone else in that way. And they were not at all distinguished. Israel, of course, is the church of the Old Testament, the people that God had chosen. Remember we, in the call to worship, he made us. That's talking about making us to be his people, not just creating us. He had chosen and blessed them to bring forth fruit for him. That's our privilege. He's the one who made them into people for himself and called them out of the world to serve him. It's he who formed them. He had redeemed them out of Egypt. He had provided for them to be his people, given them a land, delivering them and preserving them for himself, giving them his word, his instruction, giving them his spirit, giving them prophets, all of these things in order that they might bring forth the fruit with which he is pleased. This shows us then that the church is particularly God's possession. Like the owner of the vineyard, he planted it, he tended it, he put a hedge around it, he made a vat for the fruit. He built a tower. This means that the church belongs to him then all the more than the world does. Not only were we created by God as all other people were, but we were recreated. We were brought back to him to be his own special people. We were bought with a price, as the Bible says. We are meant to be called, chosen, and faithful we of all people are to bring forth fruit that God delights in, to be his true worshipers, his obedient servants, those who are filled with love to him and to each other and who obey his commandments. Our high calling presses upon us all the more when we consider all that God has done to establish us, that he has been so gracious to choose us to belong to him when we were no better than anyone else. It's a privilege to be God's people, that he has rescued us from bondage to Satan and the world, even from our own flesh, that we might live for him, that he has secured the forgiveness of our sins at the cost, 
great cost to himself at the cost of his only begotten son to die in our place, to bear our sins. Think of that. It's remarkable what God has done. What love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. How great then are our obligations to honor him as our Father. How his love constrains us to bring forth the fruit of our redemption. We are God's vineyard. Note that verse 1 also tells us that the owner of the vineyard has appointed overseers to look after what is his own possession. Look at the end of verse 1. It says, and he leased it, his vineyard, to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, this matter about the far country, it's interesting. It um, doesn't really say a far country, particularly in the original, but uh, it just means that he went abroad. Okay? He was an absentee uh, landowner, a landlord of this farm. The important point is that he left tenant farmers there in charge of his vineyard. This was a common practice at this time. We see it in the history of the times that uh, there were a lot of uh, farms like this that were owned by someone that lived somewhere else. And they would hire people out in the community to look after the farm and be responsible for it. And their payment for the, the, the owner of the land, they would give him a portion of the produce. They got to keep a portion and they gave, there was an agreed upon percentage that was, was given to the owner. So at harvest time, or vintage time, as the case is here, these absentee landlords would send to collect the portion of the produce. So these vine dressers here represent the standing officers of the church. In the Old Testament, the standing officers that were there all the time in succession were the priests and the elders and the scribes. Those were the ones that were the bishops or the overseers that looked after God's people. In the New Testament, it's the ministers and the elders, and you could add um, teachers as well if you want, uh, uh, professors, teachers, that sort of thing. And of course, the, the Levites in the Old Testament, the deacons in the New Testament, assisted these other officers but the ones who are particularly responsible for the oversight of the, of the people and uh, seeing that they would bear fruit were the priests, the elders, and the scribes in the Old Testament and the ministers and elders and teachers in the New Testament. Like the vine dressers, they were to so manage things that the vineyard brought forth fruit. They had a great task entrusted to them. And it was important for them to be faithful in looking after the owner's possession and to do what was required that it would bring forth fruit. These officers in the church are to see to it that people are taught, fed, admonished, corrected, encouraged, nurtured, and so forth, that they might bring forth fruit for God. And while the leaders are especially in view here, I think we would do well to extend the scope and recognize that to a certain extent, fathers and every individual is an overseer in God's vineyard. Each man has responsibility, if he has a household, for his household to see that his wife and children bring forth fruit for God. God lays the responsibility on him. You men are commanded to wash your wives with the, with the word of God. And you're commanded to bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Your wives helping you in that. It's a solemn yet delightful task that can only be done with prayer and with the working of the Holy Spirit. Can't do it in your own strength. And every individual in the church as well is charged with the responsibility of looking after your own soul. Ministering and ministering to others in the church as you have opportunity. You are all both vine dressers and vineyard at the same time. 
Okay, we're, we're the vineyard that's to bring forth the fruit, and we also have responsibility to look after the vineyard. You say, you look after your own soul, at least. And if you're a father, you have responsibility for the family. If you're elders and uh, ministers, you have responsibility to look after the flock. You're the only one who has access to your own soul, and so you're er to earnestly seek by God's grace to cultivate much fruit there. But there's a serious problem, okay? Simple fact, God is the owner. Serious problem. Again and again, the church's leaders forget that God owns the church. And that goes right from those who are in authority in the church to you as an individual forgetting that you have been bought with a price and that you belong to the Lord and thinking that you belong to yourself, trying to take that away from God as if you are the owner. In the parable, the owner sent his servants to the vine dressers to look for its fruit, for the fruit that was due to him. His servants were abused and some were killed. It's a horrendous picture that's painted here of this clinging on so much to this possession that they disregarded the owner. Let me read it to you with a couple of comments. Mark 12, 2 through 5. I'll read this again. Now at the vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard. He wasn't taking it all, the part that it was agreed upon. Uh, some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. He was the owner, so the fruit was to be brought forth for him. Now look at how the vine dressers treated the owner's servant. Verse 3. They took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. What wickedness is this? Think of it. They had the privilege. I mean, it was a, you know, if you were unemployed and somebody took you in to be a tenant farmer like this, you would have a living, you would have work to do, you would be taken care of. And uh, it was a privilege that they had to be working in this vineyard. But they refused to acknowledge the owner to pay the rent. But it gets progressively worse as Mark presents it here. The abuse increases, verse 4 and 5. Again, he sent them another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. So they, they increase in their violence. And again, verse 5, he sent another, and him they killed and many others, beating some and killing some. Now, this is very obviously, and I don't think anyone could hardly miss it, a picture of what Israel's leaders did to the prophets that God sent to her, of what the church of the Old Testament did to the ones that God sent to represent him coming to look for fruit. They came looking for the fruit that was to be in God's people, and they found that they didn't have the fruit because they brought forth fruits of corruption for themselves, okay, and for their idols. They were blasphemers and fornicators. They produced fruits of the flesh and not fruits of the Spirit of God. God rebukes them for that. For example, in Ezekiel, he talks about how that they were different than other prostitutes. They went out to the nations with what God had given them and paid the ones that were their lovers. Prostitutes usually get paid, but they, he said, you did it the other way around. They used what God had given them and went out. And they used the fruits of what God gave them for themselves instead of for God's purposes to bring forth children for him, they brought forth children that they offered to their idols, to Molech, that they burned in the fire. And everything between bringing forth someone for God and offering them to Molech, they did, not bringing them for God, but for themselves. So these prophets that came graciously called the church again and again to repent and to turn back to God so that they might bear fruit. They brought precious promises to all who would come to God. 
They didn't say, you're destroyed because of what you did. They said, repent and God will receive you. Hear the word of God. They pled with the people again and again. And yes, they did warn of judgments that would come. And many times there were more minor judgments. At first they were. And then they would ramp it up trying to get them to repent. God, of course, directing them and sending those judgments. Promises that were true for us. That, that in coming to God by word and prayer you will bring forth fruit. That's God's promise. You come to God for life and He will give you life. You come to Him that you might bear fruit. We were talking about this actually on the drive in today that, that, that so many times people are taught, come to God for the forgiveness of sins. Well, yes, we do. But that's, that's where it stops. And then the people will say, well, I guess I'm forgiven, but they don't have a new life. So they don't have any assurance because they're not in the life that God has called them to. He calls us to life. And in order that we might have life that brings forth fruit for God, there's forgiveness of sins. And then when we have the forgiveness of sins, we can come and serve God and we can come and bear fruit for God. But if you're not living for God, you can't have any assurance. You go, well, I think I pray this, the prayer the right way when I ask God to save me. Well, why don't you start living for God? The reason He saves you is so that you can live for Him. It's not that you're saved by the merit of that you're so good that you're still lots of sin in your life, but you have a new life, a life that bears fruit for God where before you couldn't bear fruit. So the, prov the prophets brought these wonderful promises that God will give you fruit for Him if you come to him, the Lord tells us that in Jeremiah, how these prophets were treated over a course of time. How were they treated? God sent lots of them. Jeremiah 35, 15. I have, the Lord says, I have also sent to you my servants, the prophets, rising up early. See, there's, a, there's an eagerness here. And sending them saying, turn now everyone from his evil way, amend your doings, and do not go after other gods to serve them. Then you will dwell in the land which I have given you and your fathers. Fruitfully, right? They'll dwell in the land and bring forth fruit for God. But you have not inclined your ear nor obeyed me. Jesus himself said, Matthew 23, 37, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often... I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. The owner of the vineyard. Now, there's something unrealistic here, isn't there, in the parable? I mean, what, what owner of a vineyard in his right mind is going to keep sending prophets like, or, or sending servants to collect rent like this when they, they beat them and they even kill mul multiple ones of, of, of these servants that are sent, what, what owner is going to just keep, well, I'll, I'll send another one, I'll send another one, I'll send another one. It's, it's, it's unrealistic. And it's supposed to be unrealistic in the parable. Do you know why? Because what God did is unrealistic. That God should send one prophet should be sufficient. That the people rebel and he sends another and they reject that one and a few years later he sends and then another and then another and then another. It's unfathomable that God should keep coming to his people again and again and again when he has laid before them tremendous privilege and blessing and fruitfulness for him and they continue to rebel and rebel and rebel. And His grace, He keeps coming back again and again and again and again. And then, the most unthinkable thing at all of all, can you imagine this landowner now saying, okay, so they're killing all the servants that I send to them. I'll send my son to them now. They'll respect him. 
putting his son in harm's way. He sends his own son to these scoundrels. And they even reject him. Look at verses 6 through 8. Expectation here is that surely they will receive the owner's son. But verse 6 says, Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, They will respect my son. Now, of course, this isn't teaching us that God didn't know what was going to happen. But what it's showing is what would be expected. Of course, this is the heir, this is the son. Of course, the landowner, they will respect him. Look at what they do instead. But those vine dressers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Notice something here. It's not that this one came, they said, Who is that? He's not the heir. No, it was the opposite. They said, this is the heir. They knew who he was. They knew that he was the son of the owner. And that's why they killed him. Because they were so intent on having the vineyard for themselves that they even stooped to the point that they killed the owner's son. And it was stupid. Like you kill the owner's son. What's going to happen? This obviously, again, illustrates what the leaders of the church did to God's Son when He came, that they, that, that they might bear fruit. He came to, that they might bear fruit. It's remarkable that God should ever have sent Him after what they did to the prophets. But this is what the leaders of the church are driven to do when they begin to suppose that the church belongs to them. It starts out with just not paying all the rent, Right? Send the servant away empty and treat him shamefully. Then they beat the next one. Then they kill the next one. Then they kill the son. That's how sin works. You harden yourself a little bit, and then you're hard. Something else comes along. You harden yourself another little bit more. Something else comes along. You harden yourself a little bit more. And the next thing you know, you're doing something that would be unthinkable to you. I've known... um, I've known women that would say, I would never have an abortion that have an abortion. What happened? Hardened themselves with probably sexual immorality first, having sex out in the wrong place, outside of marriage, and then hardening themselves more, and then convincing, deceiving themselves. It's a progressive thing. That's how sin works. The more hardened we become, the more unreasonable we we become until at last there's no place for Christ. Now, Jesus is not here physically for us to kill him today. But what do we do? We reject the Son's authority in the church. We reject the authority of the Father and claim the church for ourselves. Hasn't this become rampant in our day? It surely has. Corrupt church leaders... And remember that I include in not only the uh, ministers and elders, but also fathers in their home, and also each of us as individuals. Okay, So corrupt church leaders want the church to be their church instead of God's church. They want their life to be theirs and not God's. They decide what fruit should be there. I will decide the fruit that I want instead of the fruit that God desires. They decide how God should be worshipped instead of God deciding. The church will approach God the way they want. Preaching will be replaced with dialogue. Praise will be replaced with sentimental songs. The sacraments will be multiplied, perhaps, or embellished with all sorts of trappings. The simple means of grace that God has given us become so cluttered and displaced that they become ineffectual to lead us to bear fruit. We're not feeding on the word that God has given us. We're not coming in the way that he's provided for us. We're not praying. We're not seeking him. So we're not going to have the fruit. We're bringing forth the fruits we want. We want to be entertained. We want whatever it is. They set themselves up in their own message 
is the way of salvation in place of God's Son. Redemption becomes something entirely different than it is in God's Word. The message of salvation by Jesus crucified is replaced by something that will be better received, something less offensive. Like Rob Bell's message, where everybody ends up in heaven at the end. Or like Joel Osteen, where everyone is happy and, and healthy and wealthy in this world. And, and forgetting what God has called us to. They decide who should be disciplined and who should be received instead of following what Christ has said in his word. They embrace those who practice immorality, even fornication and sodomy, and they reject those who speak against these sins. And they begin to judge people on some other basis that they make up in their own minds. Judgment becomes something entirely different than what it is from God's word. That's what we see in our society. We reshape it according to the fruit that we want and, and how confused the world gets. I was thinking about that today. When you see the standard of the world and the things that they impose, they're quite contrary to God. They're, they're very confused about what, what morality is and what God really calls for. We have to come back to the Word of God, you see. We want some other fruit. It's if the church belongs to us. They enter into God's church, but then instead of bringing forth the fruit for him that he delights in, they pursue whatever they want, ignoring God himself. They look for their own honor and their own interest instead of God's honor and God's will. They actually exploit the church, which is God's redemptive agency, and make it about themselves. The leaders do this at every level again. Ministers, Elders do it, fathers do it in their homes. They want to shape their home by things that they think are important rather than what God says is important. They put even maybe something like putting education over godliness. It can be anything. Uh, sports over worshiping God, keeping the Lord's day. It, there's, there's, it just is endless, all the things that we're talking about here. And then individuals. Do the same thing, looking out to their own souls. What are your values? What fruit are you looking for in your life? Is it the honor of the world? Or is it to bring glory to God and to bear fruit for Him? But I have some very good news. Very good news that's here for us. The owner is going to set things right. I have set my king on my holy hill. He has a plan. He will reign until all of his enemies are brought under his feet. Some of them brought under him in order to serve him and to bring forth fruit. Others brought under him in judgment and cast away. He, his king will reign. If this were not so, there would be no hope at all for the salvation of anyone. All we would have is false religion that cannot save anyone. So what will God do to make things right. Well, he will judge the wicked vine dressers, the false leaders in the church. Look at verse nine. Jesus asks the question, therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? Now it's interesting because in Matthew, the people answer it. <laughs> and uh, here, Jesus answers it. But what probably happened if you put that together is that the people answered it and then Jesus confirmed the answer. And he, he says, he will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. There's two things there. Destroy the vine dressers is the first thing. Of course he will. They killed some of the servants that he sent to them, and then they killed his own son, all because they were so desperate to claim the vineyard for themselves. They deserve to die. Certainly, they were so bent on taking over that vineyard, their antagonism against God who graciously put them over his vineyard is so great that they were willing to kill God's son. That's how deep this thing went. They were willing to take the very agency that God established to save sinners, to restore what was lost in mercy, and to make it about their own purposes. We know that in 66 AD, God sent the Romans against the leaders of the Jewish church 
and those Romans destroyed Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple so that in 70 AD we have the fall of Jerusalem, God would no longer let them stay in his vineyard. They had, dri- they had driven those who, who, did not, who, who followed Christ out and those were the ones that God was with, with Christ outside the camp rather than with the leaders in Jerusalem in the camp. You see that besides destroying the wicked vine dressers, Jesus says that he will also give the vineyard to others. Now that probably made these Jewish leaders more angry than anything, even more than that he was going to drive them out, that he was going to give it to other vine dressers because they, they claimed this is our inheritance. We were born of Abraham. This belongs to us. You can't take this away from us. No, it belonged to the Son of God, Jesus, the Son of God. And it belonged to those like Abraham who knew Christ, who trusted in Christ. It doesn't belong to those who reject the heir himself, the very one who inherits all things and in whom we inherit all things. Giving the vineyard to others is a very important thing. God has done this over and over in the history of the church, and that's how the church has continued. If he didn't do this, the church wouldn't continue. You see, in this way, there are leaders in the church that, that, that do preach the gospel and that do look to Christ that they might bring forth fruit for God. They actually do want his people to be saved from their sin and to bring forth fruit. If the Lord did not give his church those who really do desire to serve him and to bring forth fruit for him, there would be no one on earth to preach the gospel. No one on earth to shepherd the people of God. No ministers, no elders, no teachers, no fathers, no individuals. Think about this in the history of the church. First, the Lord gave his church to those who professed Christ and took it away from those who rejected him. Okay, that's very plain what happened when Jesus came. Those who rejected him were cut off. God went with the ones that embraced him. But soon there were those that among that group that had professed Christ. Okay, you have a new church now, as it were. I mean, it was, there were some of the same people that were in the, the old covenant that were faithful that went on over into this with Christ. They recognized the heir like Abraham would have done if he'd been alive at that time. And like so many did, the disciples and different ones that were all Jews. But then the, and the Gentiles were added. But so there was this new, there were new leadership though. There was new leadership there that had been appointed. But soon there were those who professed Christ who began to teach that you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. They, they trusted in Jesus and preached him as Messiah, but said you have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved. So God took his vineyard from them and gave it to those who are preaching salvation by grace. That was where the Spirit of the Lord went. Then there arose those who denied that Jesus came in the flesh, that the church was, and the church was taken away from them, and it was given to those who believed that Jesus did come truly in human flesh. Then there arose those who said he was not truly God, sort of the opposite error. And the kingdom was given to those, again, who confessed that he was God. We could go on and on. We get up to the time of the Reformation where men arose who set up, had, men had arisen who had set up their own worship, who set up priests to offer sacrifices, like in the Old Testament, who make people dependent upon them for offering sacrifices, who made salvation depend on penance and rituals and giving money and various things. And the Lord gave his church to those who preached free grace justification by grace, by faith. In our own history, the Protestant church began to set aside the authority of God, particularly one of the ways, or lots of ways, but by denying God's judgment. That's the great error in our modern day in the Protestant church, teaching universalism. In the 1900s, we saw the OPC and the PCA formed out of larger denominations that they were the ones that were continuing with the word of God. 
the others went off into greater and greater confusion. And in our own ARP, there was a purging that went on, and the actual ARP itself continued, and, but many left and went to join those other churches that they were already wanting to join that were departing from the Word of God. Now it seems that we're going through the same thing all over again. A few years later, it happens over and over. We see division in the OPC and the PCA, especially uh, we're seeing some of the same sort of divisions all over again. Those who are questioning the Word of God, those who are questioning the distinctive roles of male and female. There's all kinds of things that are coming to the forefront and rising up in the church. Again, where is God going to go? How do you know who to go with when there is division? Go with the ones who go with the air. Go with the ones who go with the sun. He is the son of the owner, the son that the vine dressers reject. Jesus changes the figure here now from a vineyard to a building because the parable of the vine dressers leaves the son dead. Okay? And without parable, parables have their limitations, don't they? You can't get the son back <laughs> with the vine dresser parable. So Jesus wants to direct us now to another analogy, to a text of how although he the son was rejected by the leaders of the church. God raised him up again. So he employs Psalm 118, verse 22 through 23. In verse 10 and 11, he quotes it saying, this is Mark 12, 10 through 11. He quotes Psalm 118 saying, have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is a passage that infuriated the leaders of the Jewish church because it described them as the builders, which they were. They were actually the builders. They were lawfully ordained and in office. They were the builders, but they rejected the one on whom the whole church was to be built, the stone on which the whole church was to be built. They knew that they were rejecting Christ. They knew, many of them knew, some of them didn't know what they were doing. Many of them did. And they, they, they did it because they wanted to have the vineyard. How stupid is that? You reject the son, just like in the parable, so you can have the vineyard. And with this verse, Jesus is exposing them as the ones who would do this, the designated builders of the church. Jesus is claiming that he, the rejected stone, will become the foundation of the whole church in a way he really already was. He is the only foundation on which the church will stand. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that the official builders rejected, the official builders, but God raised up. They thought they had done away with the heir. But such a marvelous thing in our eyes, right? He was gone. The son was gone. He was crucified. He was dead. He was buried. God raised him up, showing everyone clearly that he was the Messiah on whom the church was to be built. He was the chosen vessel. He was the cornerstone. Go with those that go with him. Go with those that go with him. But how can you know who's going with him now? They're the ones that go with the word of God. Often the false teachers claim that they're going with the word of God. We've discovered something new that the church has missed all these years. We're going to tell you about it now. But look at the word. Look at the confessions of the church and see what they really say. See if these ones that claim to be going by the word are going by the word. Jesus told us in John 15, this very thing that we're talking about, that the ones who bring forth fruit for God instead of for themselves, right? The, instead of abide in me, the branch will bear fruit. If you abide in me and I in you, who is it? He said also that it's the ones who abide in his word, not the ones who abide in the established church, not the ones who stay with the chief priests and the scribes who are the official in the official seats at that time, but the ones who abide in me and in my word. God has given us his word of truth. 
so that we can discern who is following him and who is not. It doesn't mean we discount what the church has said. No, we very much engage with what those who have been following the scriptures have said through the ages. Not those who have departed from the scriptures, not traditions of men, but those who have followed the word of God. That's why it's so imperative that we follow the word of God rather than the traditions of men. God has given us his word of truth so that we can discern who is following the Lord and who is not. We must abide in Jesus as he is revealed in God's word, not as he's revealed in the imaginations of men, not as it is revealed by those who reject God's word and claim to have authority in themselves or by the spirit claiming to have authority by revelations from the spirit that they have received that are contrary to the word of God. It is clearly the Lord who raised Jesus from the dead. It is God's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Go with Him. He is the heir of all things. What a wretched thing it, it, it is to the apostate leaders that Christ was raised up. Oh, they hate that. Verse 12 tells us how the Jewish leaders responded just in hearing this from Jesus the one that they were rejecting, that, that he would be raised up to be the foundation of the whole church, that the stone that they rejected would be made the head of the corner. It made them want to kill him all the more to fulfill what Psalm 118 said, that they would reject him. And so verse 12, they sought to lay hands on him. They were ready to take him right then. They were actually seeking ways to do it. They didn't come up with one right now. They're going to do it soon enough. But they were looking for a way. But they feared the multitude, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Poor, desperate men. What are they going to achieve by warring against the Lord and his anointed? By casting off the yoke of the Father? What are they going to achieve in doing this? Be sure that you do not join this cause. There is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved than the man Jesus Christ. Not any Jesus, not any Jesus that someone makes up and calls Jesus and modifies to be whatever they want him to be, but the one and only Jesus who is God's son, who is revealed in the word of God, the one who died, not only because the builders rejected him, but because God appointed him to die for the remission of the sins of his people. It is because of this that there is no other savior, no other church, but the church that's established by him. The stone that the builders rejected is the head of the corner. He is the heir of God's kingdom because he alone is righteous. You cannot inherit God's kingdom unless you inherit it through him. Please stand and let's call on the name of the Lord. Our Lord and our God, we praise you. We praise you as we see how that when Jesus became flesh and came into this world, that he ran aground of the, um, the leaders of the church, the highest court of the church, the Sanhedrin, the elders, that the assembly that gathered together to represent you in the world. And they were the ones that represented you in the world. And yet we see that they misrepresented you in that high office that they had been given. And we see, Lord, that this was not something new. It was something that was done to the prophets through the ages, that kings and priests and different ones would reject the prophets when they came and spoke the word of God. They stoned so many of those prophets. And Father, we see that things have not changed today. As we look at the church, we see how the word of God and the gospel of grace and the truth that is preached is despised by the world. And that there is another gospel. There is a, that's not a gospel at all. There's something substitute that's set up. And many who are religious go to church and they claim this other gospel that brings forth a different fruit that's not for God, but fruit for themselves. And they claim title to that and ownership of that and they reject the truth. 
Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to hold to our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we would know that there is not another foundation, that it is only by coming to him that we bring forth fruit for you. Only by him do we have the forgiveness of sins. Only by him do we have a righteous standing. And only by him do we have life. And Father, we pray that we would not just come in a superficial way, hoping that we'll be forgiven, but we will come to be forgiven in order that we might bear fruit for you. You have told us, Lord, that if we abide in the vine of Jesus, that he is the vine, we are the branches, and that if we abide in him, we will bear much fruit, and that that fruit will be pleasing to you. And we pray, Lord, that we would not just stop there with the abiding in Christ, but we would also, as he tells us, abide in his word and his word in us, because we know that anyone can come along and claim Christ is this or Christ is that. We see that that's been done all through his history, even in the time of the apostles. Some said that he didn't come in the flesh. Some said that he wasn't God. It goes on and on. But we praise you, O Lord, that your word has given us clarity in order that we might know the truth. We thank you for that through the ages that those who have followed your word have hammered out creeds and confessions that we're able to embrace and to hold on to as well. And we thank you, Lord, that together with the whole church of God, that we're able to confess the truth and bear witness to the truth in the world. We pray, Father, that we really would shine as lights for you. Father, when we look at our fruit, the fruit that we have borne, we're very, very thankful for what you have given us, Lord. Many of us have been greatly changed from what we were. Maybe we were very angry people and you've delivered us from that, or very immoral people and you've delivered us from that, or drunkards and you've delivered us from that. Father, there's been many things that you have done but Father, when we look at the fruit in our lives, we see that there is still much to be desired. And Father, we would confess to you that we are, we are sinners before you. And our hope is not in the fruit that we have borne in itself as making us somehow justified or righteous. But Father, our hope is in Christ alone, who is our righteousness and who shed his blood for us. And yet, Lord, we also gain assurance and confidence with the new life that you have given us that we are living for you and that we're able to live for you by your grace. And we thank you for the promises that you have made that by the word and sacrament and prayer, that as we continue in these looking to Christ alone and looking to your spirit, that Father, we will bear fruit, that if we abide in Christ, we will bring forth much fruit. And we pray, Lord, that that might be more and more evident in us and that people might be able to see the difference in our lives. Father, we lose sight of that so often. We're here to bear fruit for you. It's your vineyard, Lord. You own the church. You own our lives. We have been bought with a price. So we pray that we would glorify you with our bodies. We pray, Lord, that each one of us would, would lay down our life for, for Jesus Christ and for our brothers and sisters when called to do so, that we would be willing to bear reproach for Christ, to bear dishonor and shame when called to do so. We pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom that we would not launch out like a madman, but we would launch out under the control of your word and your spirit, Lord, following you and doing what you have said. And we know that when we do, the world may indeed call us mad. They call Paul mad. But we thank you, Lord, that, that there is no madness there at all. And we pray that we would be able to indeed follow you wholeheartedly. Oh, Lord, thank you for the life that you've given us. Thank you for the hope that we have through that life and through that promise of your covenant, not only that you will forgive our sin and remember our iniquity no more, but also that you will write your law in our heart so that we will delight in it and so that we'll be able to walk in your ways. Father, turn our eyes from vanity. Keep us from embracing what the world has to offer and what they promote and what many times the church promotes. Father, may we turn back to you and follow you for you are the owner of the church you are the owner of our lives. We are here for you, O Lord. We belong to you, and we're very glad that we belong to you. We do not want to belong to the world or to the devil or anyone else. Thank you, O Lord, for your mercy to us that has called us into this fellowship. May we live together and support and encourage one another in the fellowship that we have as your people. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's come to feed at the Lord's Supper. Please be seated.
So do you want to bring forth fruit for God or for something else? It's a great question even as we come to the Lord's table here. Why do we, why do we feed upon Christ as he's represented here to us? His body represented by the bread and the shed blood represented by the, the wine that we have on this table. Why, why do we why do we feed in this sacrament upon Christ crucified? It's in order that we might have life. It's in order that we might bring forth fruit. That we who have come to Christ on the basis of his sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins might then bring forth fruit. We need to be nourished by him who is crucified in order that we might be partakers of his life. He was crucified for us in order that we might live. And this sacrament of feeding presents him to us is our ongoing nourishment. Because as he said, without me, you can do nothing. You can't bring forth any fruit at all without him. It's by faith, looking to him as promised, that we obtain new life and that we grow. And even that we're guarded from all the temptations and all the pulls of the world trying to draw us in to embrace some other fruit than the fruit that remains, the fruit that matters, the fruit that God calls us to. Here are the words of institution from Matthew 26. It says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for, the, for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine, from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You may eat at this table only if you are baptized and a communicant member of a church that confesses Jesus Christ. You should not come unless you are someone who is, in fact, looking to Christ alone for forgiveness and eternal life and who is looking to him to bear fruit. It would be hypocritical to come saying that you want to feed upon Christ if you don't want to be nourished by him to bring forth fruit for God. If you want to bring forth fruit for yourself, then it would be hypocritical to come. Not that we don't have many much sin in our life, that there's a mixture of things there, but is there in you that desire to bring forth true fruit for God? to die to self and to live for him, then Christ is crucified for you. This is my body given for you, he says. This is my blood shed for the remission of your sins. So come with faith and with confidence, looking to him. If you're trusting in him and yearning to bring forth fruit for God, come with hope and encouragement, looking to the one who was crucified. If you abide in him and his word abides in you, you will bear much fruit and your fruit will remain. Let's ask him to bless us as we come and to bless the bread and the wine that are on this table. Most gracious, merciful, heavenly Father, you are the father, the owner of the vineyard, the owner of the church, the owner of each individual member. We have each been bought with a price, and so the whole church has been also bought with a price, the price of the blood that is represented on this table, the blood that was shed by your only Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent and whom the church rejected, officially rejected. We thank you, Lord, that there were many in the church who did not reject, who embraced him, many that you called by your gracious, powerful working and spirit 
to come and receive. Father, we pray that, that we would be counted with those who receive this glorious inheritance with your Son. He is the owner. He is the one. We don't come and embrace this inheritance by our own grasping. We embrace it by bowing to Jesus Christ, by trusting in Him, by faith in Him. And we pray, Lord, that as you've given us this bread and wine to represent Christ crucified, to be a sign and a seal to us of the interests that we have in Christ, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would be pleased to, to bless us as we come. And that the result of our coming and feeding here at this table today would be an increase of fruitfulness in our lives. That having come and heard the word today, that the result of that would also be an increase in fruitfulness in our lives. And that the prayers that we have brought before you today, that the outcome of that would be more fruitfulness in our lives for you. Father, we ask you to work in us by your son. He's the root, he's the source. We can't go and bring forth fruit as a branch that's separated from him, a branch that's cut off from the very one that nourishes us. It's impossible. But we thank you that you told us, you said it, Lord, that we could bring forth much fruit if we abide in him and if his word abides in us. And so, Lord, we are looking to you now for this blessing in our lives. Oh, Father, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now receive the blessing of the Lord our God. And the God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.